Hello everyone and welcome to Cinderful Gaming. I hope you're all doing well, I hope you're all staying safe and most of all I hope you're all fighting that war against the grey. Today's video or we're going to look at the best and worst armies to start with for Warhammer Age of Sigmar 3rd edition. In this video we're going to give you tips for getting into the game and we're going to give you some ideas for armies that are perfect for someone brand new getting into the game system. There will be a criteria and sort of, I guess, a set of things we look at when thinking about this and we'll go into them in a second and show you all exactly what we're talking about and why we're talking about these things. But this video is going to aim to show you like, and steer you in the right direction of armies that are going to be easier to learn the game and all and collect the game and play the game and start the game with than rather some armies that maybe are not. This doesn't necessarily mean that all the armies in the best pile will be the most competitive armies in the game. And this doesn't necessarily mean all the armies in the worst pile will be the least competitive armies in the game. What we're aiming to give you is armies that you can play, learn the game with, and all of that. Everything gets taken into account with this. So without further ado, let's get cracking. We'll look at the criteria we're using for the video first, and then we'll go into the top five best and worst armies to get in with for the game. All right, and so here is the criteria that we're using for judging what is the best and worst army to get into the game with. Now, if you think we've missed an army, or we've put an army maybe in a category that hurts it, um, say in the worst, and you don't think it should be there, definitely let us know. But this is our personal list over playing many games with many different armies uh, across the edition so far. So the criteria, first of all, is has a star collecting box or a similar point of entry. So this could mean it features in, say, a starter set. It has a readily available box set. Uh, besides the start collecting, we obviously are seeing new versions of this come out alongside uh, future releases. Something more similar to 40K's Combat Patrol boxes coming out for Age of Sigmar in the future. Um, so that's all taken into account next up the model count on the army is not massive this doesn't mean that we can't have large model count armies but we really want to be making sure the model count isn't i guess so expensive that it becomes a problem for other things um, such as the cost of the army we want the army to be a relative sort of cost and stay within that sort of bubble and on average, now this is in Australian dollars because this is what I know, but the average cost of an Australian Warhammer Age of Sigma 2000 point army, um, now that's not going into everything, but getting a competent army on the table is around from $800 to $1200 Australian. Um, so that is roughly what we pay for an army here. And so that's generally what will be going on. We want an army that sticks somewhere near that. We want a lack of summoning in these armies, mainly because summoning just puts extra pressure on a person to have to buy extra models to be able to play with the full mechanics of their army. So definitely not a fan um, of having this in any army that gets someone into the game because it's just extra models you have to buy. And then painting skill required. So this also can relate back to model count being not massive because having to paint 200 figures is just in itself harder than having to paint 60. So having fewer models to paint that are not some of the more detailed kits, there are definitely armies that are much easier to paint than others in Warhammer Age of Sigma. We then want multiple ways to play with this army as well. So why this is important, well, multiple ways to play, what we mean by this is, first of all, either having very distinct sub-factions, so a battle tome that gives you very, very distinct ways to play, that if you want to play with this set of models within the battle tome, there is a clear, distinct sub-faction to play with those models. Also, in some armies, there will be, I guess, multiple uh, types of units. So we could look at an army book, say, like Ogre Moor Tribes in this instance, where they have both Beast Claw Raiders and the Gut Buster half of the army. So you could start off playing Beast Claw Raiders, but you always have the option to move into a full Gut Buster army because it is part of your faction, and you can have that sort of midway point army that's part Beast Claw, part Gut Busters, in the meantime so you've got this i guess way to move into another faction without actually changing your faction we want an army that's easy to play we don't want an army with over complicated rules there are many armies in the game that do have some really i guess difficult rules to understand and master and we want to avoid those armies for new players you can definitely pick them up but just be aware picking an army up like that will definitely lead you to maybe struggling in your first few games trying to remember all your rules so we want to have an army that's really easy to remember with all its rules 
And last of all, this does matter somewhat, and that is competitiveness. You don't want people to get into the game with the weakest army in the game without at least knowing that is what it is. It's completely fine if you want to pick up an army because you love the models, but it is the absolute weakest in the army in the game or by a country mile, you want to at least know that so you know what you're expecting. There is nothing more disheartening to a new player than getting into the game with an army they love only to find out, well, it's actually terrible on the tabletop. If you know that, you can you know adjust your expectations for it and go, well, I won two games at this tournament, so that's an amazing job for an army that really struggles to even win one. With that said, that is our criteria, so let's get cracking and let's check out our top five best first, and then we'll finish with the worst. So if you don't want to hear what the worst is, you can leave halfway through the video. And number one, the best armies to start with, we're going to start off with Stormcast Eternals, the poster boys for Warhammer Age of Sigmar. So, first of all, they are a great army for getting into. Let's talk about star collecting boxes. They obviously have a multitude of different star collecting boxes. They are also in the current starter set for Warhammer Age of Sigma. So, this means there's just a bunch of great ways to get into the army with a bunch of cheaper miniatures. They generally are a lower model count army. Even a, I guess, high-end model count Stormcast army probably won't take you above like 60, 70 models at maximum. And the cost of the army, thanks to all these star collecting boxes, and generally thanks to being a range of models that is a starter army, they do have quite a few cheaper options of kit. Summoning-wise, the army doesn't have summoning at all, so that's not an issue for us here. And painting-wise, Stormcast Eternals are one of those armies that any paint scheme can look good on. They take metallics really well. They take flat, big, bold colors really well. Um, if you're coming from 40k, just pick a Space Marine chapter you like and throw a color scheme on them from that because it works perfectly. Um, they also have the option, because they've got large flat surfaces, not only are they easy to paint, but they give you room to learn to paint and to try new stuff with paint. You can try freehand on those big bold areas. You can try to do non-metallic metal on their weapons and on their armor. You can try all these more advanced techniques as you get more confident with that sort of stuff in your hobby. So not only are they good to start with for painting, but they're good to learn and move on to with painting. The army does have multiple ways to play as well, and they are easy to play thanks to how the battle tome is laid out. The new battle tome for Stormcast Eternals really does lead you into playing certain styles of the army under certain sub-factions. So if you are like, for instance, Dracothian Guard, they become Battleline and Hammers of Sigma, and it sort of just combines everything together nicely for you to not only cover the Dracothian Guard's weakness of mortal wounds, but also just a bunch of other things as well. There's lots of different things where the sub-factions unlock specific units for you as Battleline, and it all just combines really well. Competitiveness, Stormcast are decent. They do have the issue that there are a lot of War Scrolls in the army, and there are some that are clearly better than the others. This can lead to the fact the army may have an issue with certain parts of it being more powerful than the other, but that's all part of playing the game. Stormcast generally don't have many terrible units, though they don't all have extremely good or sometimes even good units. So it is worthwhile uh, just maybe looking a little bit more into each specific unit before you go down that path. Number two, Auric War Clans. So starting off, we've got a star collecting box for the Iron Jaws part of the faction, and they also have the Cruel Boys featured in the star collecting box alongside the Stormcast Eternals. So another couple of great ways to get into the army. Model count wise, Auric War Clans generally are much more elite than other armies. They can do horde style armies, but they generally don't have quite as many models as I guess the biggest horde armies in the game, a high Oracle War Clans army may get to 100 models at maximum. And that's playing particular sub-factions, which I probably don't recommend, like the Bone Splitters to start off with. Cost-wise, thanks to being in the starter set, and also thanks to having a star collecting box, this army can be quite cheap to get into in comparison to other armies. Also, the fact that a lot of the units you want are in those two boxes, so you're not going to have to spend a lot of money outside those more discounted boxes. Summoning wise, the army doesn't summon, so once again, not a problem for us here. And painting Oryx, much like the Stormcaster Turners before, have large flat areas that allow them to uh, take color and metallics equally as well as each other. What's great as well is the fact that Oryx have green skin or whatever skin color you want, because they are your models, paint them however you want. But green skin on them allows you to learn more when you're painting and can be a lot more forgiving when painting than, say, actual flesh tones. Uh, of your normal variety of what you would expect in humans. 
painting wise this is what's great about them it just allows them to take that color really well and you don't have maybe the struggles that other sort of armies do while having to paint more natural skin tones the army does have multiple ways to play in fact it is three armies in a single battle tome here you have both all of the bone splitters the iron jaws and the cruel boys and you also have a sub faction called the big war which is all of them taken into one and melded together in a massive army for me the two i strongly suggest are starting with are cruel boys and iron jaws iron jaws more than any other iron jaws are really simple and just like getting in a good scrap while cruel boys are a little bit more sneaky and require a little bit more cun and play Bone Splinters don't have a star collecting box, and so this is an issue for them, and they're also the highest model count ones, so I probably don't recommend getting into Bone Splinters to start off with, but our War Clans do have a great ease of play with those first two factions. Competitive wise, Oric War Clans are doing really well in the meta at the moment. They're really strong. They like going and getting fight, and they've got enough tricks in the bag with armies like Cruel Boys, and even the Iron Jaws have tricks themselves to really take it to the big armies within the meta. Number three for best armies, we have Seraphon. So Seraphon are a little bit interesting. First of all, they've got two star collecting boxes, one for the Skinks and one called Star Collecting Seraphon. These are both fantastic boxes that give you a bunch of great units. The Star Collecting Skinks is probably the more competitive out of the two box sets, but you can definitely use all the units in the Star Collecting Seraphon box equally as well. Seraphon are one of those armies where I don't think there's any terrible units within the army. They're just a sum that maybe don't hold up to the very best in the army. Model count wise, Seraphon can be quite uh, heavy in some instances of the army. If you're going for, say, skink heavy lists, you're going to have a lot of skinks. But luckily, those boxes do come in 24 model boxes, so you can get them relatively cheap. They are not the most expensive 20 model box in the game, so this does help with bringing the cost down of the army. Also, those skinks feature inside the Star Collecting Skinks box, as you might expect, so you can get them there. The Star Collecting Seraphon box does give you a bunch of the more uh, Saurus style units like the Saurus Warriors and Saurus Knights in there for a discounted cost as well. Painting wise, Seraphon, thanks to being all scales, take dry brushing really, really well and really simple techniques like that can have you a fantastic looking army on the tabletop in no time at all. One of my best things about Seraphon though is the multiple ways to play. This is one of my favorite battle tomes in the game for having a unit that you want to play with and then a specific sub faction to run that unit in want to play with all saurus well they've got a sub faction for you want to play with all monsters go check out thunder lizards this is what's really great about it the one thing i will say with seraphon is on the summoning aspect they do have half of their army and these two particular sub factions that work well with summoning lists this i probably recommend staying away from but you could easily start in the other list the coalesced side of the army as it's called and play with that first and gradually move yourself into the starborn which is a summoning style army later in your journey into warhammer age of sigma not having to buy that stuff to start with Seraphon are quite easy to play. Thanks to these sub-factions being very direct in how they sort of put you into this army, wanting to play with these particular units, it allows you to play quite easily with the army. The Coalesce side is by far much easier to play than the Starborn, as summoning does add an extra layer of play on top of the game, and you generally have more powerful wizards and more magic to deal with on that side of the army as well. Competitiveness, at the moment, Seraphon are the top dog in the meta. They are really, really strong competitively, though it is more the Starborn side than anything that is doing that, but Thunder Lizards are doing really well as well in the meta. There's not really a weak link in this army. Next up, we have the Ogre Moor Tribes. Now, this is an army that hasn't received an update for Warhammer Age of Sigma 3rd Edition, or wasn't a very late army in 2nd Edition either, like the Seraphon. However, Ogre Moor Tribes, I think, have a lot of things going for them that make a great army to get into the game. First of all, they have a fantastic start collecting box, maybe the best start collecting box in all of Warhammer in general. You get one of these amazing stone horns you see pictured here, along with a bunch of Mournfang, at a really good discounted price. The good thing about that stone horn kit is it contains three different versions of stone horn and three different versions of thunder tusk, all in the one kit. So you can literally purchase this box again and again and again to save that cost of your army and get a competitive army as well. The model count for the army, especially when playing with the Beast Claw Raiders, is really low, and like I said, the cost does come down. The army doesn't have any summoning, so once again, that cost is down even more. You can pick up this army for well below the average cost of an army for Warhammer Age of Sigmar. 
Painting wise, large areas of skin and large areas of fur make painting really easy. There's some really great tips and tricks you can find for painting large areas of flesh really nicely. I recommend looking at the Warhammer TV how to paint a Thunder Tusk Beast Rider video because that is a fantastic way to show you how to get these models done at to a really high standard really quickly. You can also play this army in multiple ways. I use this as an example for this particular reason at the start of the video. Ogremore tribes have two distinct sub-factions in their army. They have a, lot of, a couple of other bits and pieces like Firebellies and man -eaters, but the main two are the Gutbusters and the Beastclaw Raiders. You can start with the really elite and really cheap to get into Beastclaw Raider half of the army and move yourself over to Gutbusters partially and then wholly if you so wish to to get a new army that plays entirely different. The sub-factions for the army make this really easy to do as well as there are tons of sub-factions in the book and they all work around specific units within the book. Competitiveness, ogres are decent. They're that army that just likes to fight. They can beat the very best armies in the game with a good set of rolls, uh, thanks to just some of their abilities, doing mortal wounds on the charges, etc. But they also sometimes can suffer from being, I guess, a one-trick pony, which is go smash people in the face. All in all, ogres are a great army to play. I really enjoy them. And number five for best armies to get started with, we have Sons of Behemoth. Now, this one's going to be a little bit different in how we talk about it because they don't obviously, I guess, meet the criteria for some of our issues, but I think overall they are a fantastic army to get into the game with. So, first of all, they don't have a start collecting box. This should come as no surprise. Their start collecting box is effectively go buy one Gargan. Uh, model count wise, well, even the most model heavy army of Sons of Behemoth will have 10 models. That is taking 3x3 three three of the little Man Crusher Gargans and one Mega that is going to give you 10 models. Cost wise, this army is going to be on the upper side of our cost. Um, however, getting this army to like a thousand points to start off with, buying one Mega and say three babies, is relatively cheap. Um, the babies do not cost as much as the Megas, and you can probably get a thousand point army up for $600 around about in Australian. Summoning, obviously, the army doesn't have any. Painting-wise, large areas of skin. Like I said, there's some fantastic videos out there. You could definitely use the Ogre video I mentioned previously uh, for looking at how to paint your Sons of Behemoth skin. But also, they've got lots of little details on them, so they can be a really enjoyable paint. They will tank a lot longer than some other armies, but the fact there is only, you know, a few models means each time you complete one, you completed a massive portion of your army. The army does have a few different ways to play. What's really cool is you can use the same models and just change which mega you're using to change your sub-faction. This is pretty cool because it leads to an easy way to play. The book just sort of flows out from that. There are some that are maybe better than others, but there's lots of different builds you can try out to try out some different fun things with your army. Competitive wise, this army is really good. There is something like a 60% average of players at events going four and one. So four wins, one loss. Um, so this army can carry you a little bit and make up for your maybe naivety or inexperience in the game. It's a fun army. It's got some cool models. It's decently cheapish if you build it in certain ways. I think it's a great army to get started with at the moment in Warhammer Age of Sigmar 3rd Edition. And so now we go into the worst section. And I will say I will try to bring out all the positives in these armies when I can. And anything I say about these armies definitely should be taken more as a warning rather than something to turn you off not collecting the army. The worst armies definitely can win games of Warhammer Age of Sigma. It's just worth knowing the issues getting into that army when you start with. So first of all, we've got the Hedonites of Slanesh. First of all, their start collecting box focuses on demons, which isn't a bad thing in itself, however it doesn't contain some of the more competitive options for the army, and it is relatively light on points. That start collecting box barely scratches around 400 points, when compared to some of the other start collecting boxes that are almost double that in points within the box. Model count wise, this army can be quite heavy in its models. A big issue of this, first of all, comes down to the fact it has a very heavy summoning mechanic through the army. So a lot of the stuff you are going to do in Hidden Arts to Slanish is based around getting those depravity points, getting your summoning points and summoning stuff to the table. The army is generally heavily costed, so while you may only have, I guess, an average army at best on the table to begin the game with, you are going to be having a lot more models summoned than most other armies in the game. 
cost wise this of course raises the cost of the army because now not only are you need to buy your army on the table you need to buy the options for your summoning as well and that is one of the key issues with summoning armies painting wise there are some more difficult units and kits to paint within this there is definitely a lot of uh, armor detail on the units like the pain bringers and the twin souls but there's also some really easy paint jobs in the army as well things like the demons and all the demons really do come together quite nicely the army does have a couple of different ways to play which is i guess a positive for it though there are some that are clearly better than others but you can play all demons all mortals and there are some good mixes in there Ease of play, this army is definitely not an easy one to play. Its competitiveness is rather low in the meta at the moment, and this really means that you have to play very smart and very uh, accurately with this army in order to succeed. This can lead to your first few games with this army really being tough. You may find you get just taken off the table with doing absolutely nothing, but with those learning curves, you will get better and better. This learning curve for this army is definitely very, very steep. Number two, and perhaps the Hindu Knights of Slanish's arch nemesis, the Lumineth Realm Lords. Now, a big issue with Lumineth Realm Lords, first of all, is there is no Stark Lantern box. At the moment, there is the Battle Force box coming out this Christmas for them, so that could be a great purchase to get into Lumineth if you can grab one. However, they don't have a generic one, so in the future when this battle box is no longer available, that may be an issue. Model count wise, the army's not terrible. It doesn't have an overly massive range of models uh, in an army of it, so that's not terrible. But cost wise, generally you're paying more for all these units than any other army in the game. The general troops cost more than most other armies. Summoning wise, the army doesn't summon, so that is certainly a positive for it. However, painting is definitely one of the issues with Lumineth Realm Lords, as they have a lot more advanced style painting techniques and skill required to paint these models, as they've got a lot more detail crammed into generally smaller models. The army does have multiple ways to play though. It's got three distinct sub factions, which makes it really fun to play. In either, say, at the moment, your Hurricane, your Alarith or your Venari, which gives you a lot of options. However, ease of play with the army is really where I think this army comes into my not great for starting category, mainly because it's got so many rules. This army is loaded with rules. It is so heavy on that part of the game that it really can become quite overbearing and quite a lot for a brand new player. However, with this, these rules do make the army quite competitive, so you've definitely got that once you finally get your head around all of this, you will have a really competitive army. However, it can take quite a while to get to grips with how this army plays, just due to the abundance of extra stuff there is to learn with the army. Number three for the worst armies to get into the game with, we have Gloom Spy Gits. Now, I will say this is an absolutely amazing looking army, so I understand when a lot of people want to get into this army. So take this all as a bunch of warnings and issues that come along with the army when you're getting into the game with it. First of all, the Star Collecting Box. While the army does have a Star Collecting Box, I perhaps think it is probably the worst Star Collecting Box that is available in Warhammer Age of Sigmar. It gives you a bunch of units that generally don't go together well and have no real cohesion between them. The issue with Gloom Spike Gits, of course, is in various variations of the army, whether that be Squeaks, Spiders, or the Grots themselves, you're going to have a lot of models. I guess the upside of this is generally they are quite easy to paint. The character models have a lot of detail, but generally most of your troops are relatively easy to knock out in very short spaces of time. Cost-wise, of course, having to have such a large horde army will increase the cost of your army, and even if you're playing with a more elite army of trogs, this is going to be an expensive start for an army. Painting-wise, like I said, the characters are really detailed and really heavy to paint, but your troops come together really, really well, and the lack of summoning definitely is a bonus. For an army that's already got a lot of models, you definitely don't want to add summoning to that as well. The army does have multiple ways to play, though, and that is a good thing for it. Um, one of the things you can do is play one of the many different sub-factions, and generally an army works best well when it's one of the particular types. Being either Spider Fang, Gloom Spike Gits themselves, the Grot Squigs, or Trog Herd, all in the different parts of the army. This allows you multiple ways to play. However, the army does have an issue with ease of play. Because the army relies on multiple debuffs and the same thing at the moment, it does lead it to not being the most competitive army in the game as it doesn't really work. It's got a lot of random mechanics and a lot of debuffs that do the same thing. So the issue with this is that you're going to have to spread out your army and your force, which grots really don't want to do. 
this doesn't make for easy playing for the army because you've not got a lot of abilities you can rely on and stuff like that even your allegiance ability is completely unreliable so with all of this it just makes them really hard to get going in any sort of competitive sense or generally even in casual play the army can just literally lose you a game without you even doing anything by some bad rolls from your squigs and random movement or the moon just not deciding to show up for a couple of turns Number four, we have the Beasts of Chaos. Now, I will say, this stock collecting box for the army is not terrible. It features some cool models. However, the monster in it maybe isn't the greatest thing in all of the game. But the two units you get inside it and the Bray Shaman are all solid purchases. And the fact you get this all at a discount isn't a bad thing at all. Model count of the army is definitely an issue though. So you need a lot of models for this army. It is a really heavy horde style army. And that at least was with the Brayherd style of the army from which you get the Star Collecting Box stuff with. Um, you can go more elite armies if you choose to go, you know, heavy Thunderscorn or heavy of the Warherd style. But the main one, the Brayherd stuff here is definitely much more Horde style. Cost of the army can be really expensive. Even that Star Collecting Box, it only drops you around 400 points of models. So you're not going to get the most out of it. It's not a box you really want to buy more than maybe two of at best. And so you're going to be spending a lot of mo money getting lots of models on the table. Painting wise, it's not a terrible army to paint. However, with a lot of fur and a lot of basic sort of skin stuff and skulls, the army does come together really quickly with painting, even for a horde army. Summoning is another issue for the army and this further increases the cost of the army which already generally starts to go a little bit high due to having a really heavy summoning mechanic which requires you to have not only lots of stuff to summon but lots of different things to summon as well for different options. The army does have multiple ways to play though, which is a cool thing. So you can either play with the Bulgors in a heavy army for the Warherd sub-faction, you can play with Thunderscorn, the Dragon Ogres, or you can play with Brayherd, or even a mix, or even go all Zangor heavy as well. So there are definitely multiple ways to play with this army, which definitely is a bonus for it. Ease of play isn't perhaps maybe the easier. The army doesn't really do a lot of damage, and so the way this army plays is board control, which is a much harder way to play and learn to master this sort of skill of style of play. Competitiveness, Beasts of Chaos aren't doing great at the moment. They are very low down in the meta, though with really high skilled players, they can do really well. They just require a very different way to play the game than a lot of other armies. So you may find you may master your Beasts of Chaos, but you may struggle with other armies because you're playing the game in an entirely different way. And lastly, at number five, we have Cities of Sigma. Now, this is my favorite faction in the whole game. However, it is definitely not a beginner-friendly faction. Unless you're coming from Warhammer Fantasy and have many of these models sitting around lying, doing nothing, you're going to struggle to find a lot of these models. The army does have a couple of cool star collecting boxes for the Anvil Guard and Greywater Fastness, or rather, it should be Tempest Eye parts of the army. You will struggle to find a lot of models for this army in your games workshop or your friendly local game stores and a lot of stuff from the army is direct order online only so this means you're going to have to wait you're not going to be able to buy your mod models off the shelf a lot of the time which is certainly an issue model count for this army varies a lot but generally it will be much more heavy than it will be light there are very few styles of this army that run low model count and it's not impossible to do such an army but it definitely isn't the normal with the army Cost-wise, just having online-only order models means you run into a few costing issues. First of all, a lot of friendly game stores that do online orders, or give you discount rather, don't apply that to your online order-only models, so this can be certainly an issue. The fact as well that Games Workshop doesn't stock a lot of these models does make those random purchases really hard once again, so you know, you're know you more likely to not spend them. Summoning, the army doesn't have summoning, so there's definitely a positive for it, unless you're running, you know, something really niche like a branch wraith inside of Living City to summon some dryads onto the table. There is very few ways to summon in the army. And painting-wise, there are a lot of really simple, but really, and also a lot of really difficult kits to paint in the army as well. So it is a bit of a mixed bag, depending on which sort of route you go with the army. Multiple ways to play, though, is certainly something the army has in abundance. It's got a very well laid out sub-faction system in the book, which makes it really easy to play certain styles of army. Even with the same models, you can run different armies. 
Ease of play perhaps isn't the easiest because it does require you knowing a lot about the army and putting certain units in the right sub-factions. And maybe unlike some other books like Seraphon that we mentioned earlier in the video, it's not quite as easy to see where these units fit. Competitiveness City sits around the middle, um, which is not a bad place. It can definitely win you stuff and it can definitely lose you stuff, all based on just a good picking of the units. There is a lot of traps within the army. So for me, the big things that make City one of the worst armies, first of all, is being direct order online only. This is just a massive hit against the army, as it generally sometimes scrubs out your discount from your friendly local game store online retailers and forces you to go have to go through direct from GW. So you're missing out on those discounts, and also you're missing out on getting stuff generally a quicker action than you would if an army had stuff on the shelves. The other big thing for cities with me is it generally has a lot of trap units. There are a lot of things you can buy in this army that without the right proper skills uh, or the knowledge won't work as well as you want them to. There's a lot of cool models in the army and just getting trapped by those cool models that don't particularly work in the style of army you're running can be a massive issue for the army. But that is our list of the top five best and worst armies to get into Warhammer Age of Sigma 3rd edition. Let us know your thoughts down in the comments below. Well, that's the end of the video. Thank you all for watching. Please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Also, while you're at it, if you'd like to come chat more with me and other members of our fine community here at Sinful Gaming, you can do so by following the link in the description of the video to our Discord server you can come chat with all of us. Also, if you'd like to help support the channel in another way, you can do so either by Patreon or YouTube members. Both of these greatly help the channel and continue to allow us to do what we are doing. We'd like to give a shout out to everyone who has done such, so a special shout out to our patrons, Christian Weir, James Soren, Greenskins Gaming, AJC, Kenny Lull, Outer and Shot First, Andrew Bowen, Nathan Fee, The Rising Ape, Cure Dynamic, Agu, Anthony B, Anton Nielsen, JJ Austrian, Average Wargamer, Domir, and Mark Harvey. And a special shout out to our YouTube members as well, Green Roots Gaming, Kenton Young, Steve T, The Rulesia, Chris Wallace, Ronya, Vinny, Locklorick, The Johnny84, David Ellsworth, Revenar, and Wolfric Nick. Lastly, a special shout out to our amazing helpers on the channel. First of all, Lady Witchfox Art, who does all the amazing artwork for the channel, and 2X Morphic as well, who does all the amazing background work for our Discord server. Thank you both very, very much. That's it for the video, though. Please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe once again. Stay safe, everyone. Stay well. And most of all, keep fighting that war against the great. Ciao for now.